Gonna be your cricket, uh Living life with no regrets gonna be me, uh Didn't believe in me and now they wanna meet me, uh I believe in me, my dream of reality, uh Ooh, baby, I'm the best, I'm the greatest Holy Ghost by my side, no one else's I believe I've achieved all my disguise Ain't no stopping me, as Bobo sucks as watch see Supporting me by watching me quietly. Yo, got a flash of mom and bubbles, excess and see. Who are you with me? Do you remember me? So you know, get my friends and family. Strangers are the ones who really supported me. What is up? We are uh, actually at North Be May the North Be With You uh, convention and we are again here with Roger. Roger. Hey everybody. We're here at May the North Be With You, which um, is a pretty interesting two day. Star Wars special here, so um, the, there'll be a lot tomorrow of things for sale, but today very interesting stories and panels. I'm on at 3.15, I think. Yeah. Nice. So he's going to be uh, chatting away at 3.15, and uh, we're going to see if we can catch some of this stuff and get that going. So look at this, he's got his setup right here. Arjun is eating his all right, so we'll catch you in a bit. So uh, here we go. We are at the Star Wars convention. We got everybody here doing their thing. We got Roger in the back down there. Oh, he's getting covered right now, but he's signing autographs right now. And uh, this is just a little, uh, you know, Q and A for some private, uh, I guess, people. And uh, we're gonna have. Roger up around 3.15 and so we're gonna record him and see what he says and chats about his journey so it's pretty cool there you go may the north be with you and they got the Star Wars stuff all the figurines I guess this is the original stuff look at that So this stuff is uh, pretty cool and I think they are up in price now because obviously these are the original uh, collection. Hi, sorry, do you own this? Thanks, no? Jason. I'm just looking after it. So this is the original stuff? Original toys, right? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, no worries, no worries, yeah. I know that this is a very expensive wall. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine, that's for sure. Thank you. So there you go. So this is, uh, they're pretty up there, the, the original Star Wars stuff. So if you collectors out there actually have Star Wars stuff, make sure you uh, get it appraised and, uh, and see what the value is. You never know, right? All right, so I don't know. We'll see if I can get, get a chat with somebody here and uh, see what's up. So, here we go. I think they're going to have the first panel talking. There was a short intermission here. It's pretty loud. We got Brian Lee May there. Everyone's talking. Roger's down in the corner there. He is uh, signing away autographs. And um, yeah, we're going to see how this whole panel thing goes. There he is doing is chatting I'm so uh, honored to be in this kind of event and um, you know get to see all the the greats uh, in their journey of life doing the things that they're doing and creating some big legacy you know so anyways there he is right there <laughs> nice so yeah I think they're gonna start doing another Q&A soon and we'll see what happens wrong there. Because, um, George Lucas had already promised, uh, I guess by, by late 77, he already made a promise to ABC that there would be a, a 
Christmas special involving this really cool character, Boba Fett. Um, you know, shortly thereafter, probably Kenner, he had made, uh, uh, you know, told them that this was going to happen. And Kenner was was going to release the figure years before the movie actually came out. Uh, it really goes to show George Lucas's marketing genius that, um, you know, to tease that sort of thing out uh, in between the movies when things were getting quieter, and it's, uh, you know, something that you wouldn't you wouldn't see nowadays really that they would. Uh, release this really cool figure with like no movie or anything to go along with him. Uh, so on stage with me, uh, I have uh, Jim Swearingen, who you will recognize from the previous panel, uh, who was conceptual designer at Kenner and worked on the first uh, Boba Fett figures. And then we have uh, John Celestri from Nelvana, which was right here in Toronto. And he worked on the Christmas special and was actually uh, the one to to develop the Boba Fett character for the Christmas special, which was Boba's first public appearance. Uh, so welcome, guys. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Uh, very secretive about what they were going to do next, because you know we had the 77, the, the summer of 77 is Star Wars, and so now we're working on. Who's the villain? Because we figured that, you know, Darth Vader had been tossed out, you know, and gone. And so, who is the new one? We didn't think about it just becoming that. There was no idea of a trilogy. Yeah. There was just Star Wars. Yeah. Right? You only had the first movie to go. Only, that's, that's all we had. Yeah. So, when we got the, um, the assignment, I said, okay, well, this is cool. I get to do this new villain. And so my understanding is I get model sheets that had already been okay about, about April of 78. What exactly is a model sheet? A model sheet is a rotation of, of uh, a full front, three quarter, side, and rear of what the character would look like. You know, and, before, and you have to uh, do a model sheet to be able to understand how to rotate the character. This is before computers. You know, to do that, we, we didn't have a model or doing that. So, and you, I guess you've met Lucas before at this point. Yes, uh, right? we did. But uh, to go hang out uh, with Lucas and yeah. uh, yeah. it's been pretty yeah. crazy. People have heard this before. This is the trip I most had the most regret about because uh, after having lunch with his dog, Indiana, and kind of sitting around in the their nice living room area. This is in their offices before the range. And Dave Okada and Gary Kurtz went off to talk about something else. I don't know what they probably secrets that I wasn't allowed to hear. But I had an hour alone with George Lucas in his office. Got to sit, you know, across the desk from the, the master. The guy I've been trying to please for a couple of years. And uh, we talked about everything. Uh, you know, a little bit of Star Wars, but he had, but I'm sitting, we're just, I talk, he, had, he had a comic book store in New York that he was partnering with a friend from college, and he had a Frank with that painting that I had a poster of, and he had a Buck Rogers ray gun, tin ray gun on his, on, so he had, we were just kind of like two guys talking about kind of, you know, I don't, he's a little older than I am, but not much. We were just chatting, you know, it's like, and then an hour goes by, and Dave Okada finally shows up. And in that meeting, the biggest regret was I never said, George, you need a toy designer working here with two guys. <laughs> and I tell you, it really was. It's like, I just didn't have the presence of mind at that point, or maybe the guts to say, George, you need to hire me out here. Because it would have made things much better. <laughs> but. Uh, I didn't have the presence of mind, but that would that, uh, you know, be that close to George Lucas after working on his movie for a while was uh, just, you know, now I just think about how lucky I was. Because nobody, just like everything else, you, you um, as time goes by, you, uh, things happen and they kind of, you escape your grasp and you, you all you have is that memory, but, you know, I've enjoyed everybody. I've enjoyed every Star Wars thing. TV, movies, they all have a, you know, I, 
everybody, oh, I hate this or I don't like that one. Or, I'm like, I love it. I like it, love it, like it all. I love some more than some others, but it's just, I enjoy every time there's something going on. Like, and I went back, I said, just the other day, where I went back and watched the making of the first movie on a video, and it was like, oh yeah, I remember you know, all that stuff, and you know, came that close to people, so it's really great fun. And and Boba Fett's just the, the it was the ice on the cake, because I didn't really work on production stuff after that. And then shortly after, you know, I moved up, I moved to the 17th floor and we went in the so. And then I didn't miss all that creative <coughs> stuff. I didn't get to do kick bash anymore. Well, I think, I think we all understand. And then from there, I became an assistant director and then a director. So I directed for many years and directed a ton of half hour, 11 minute series productions at Nelvana. Cool. And, and then a number of other places after Nelvana showed me the door. <laughs> and uh, and you're a Sheridan College uh, yep, alumni? Yeah, Sheridan. Yeah, yeah which is just uh, a stone store. Just over there. Yeah. All right, now Brian, can you introduce yourself? You gave the Coles notes. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't talk about any of the shows you were on. Oh, oh, yeah, let's hear it. Well, you can uh, check the out on Internet Movie Database, yeah. although I don't believe them all. I did not <laughs> work. I didn't work on Midnight Movie Massacre, but I have some other Lawrence Jacobs. <laughs> 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 Care Bears, Babar, uh, Beetlejuice, Magic School of Us, Cyber Chase, Johnny Test. Uh, running out of oh, and you're oh yeah. So I right worked on, on droids and Ewoks yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. as an AD. Um, birds. Oh yeah, Birds was a show that I, I created and uh, was on ABC for one season. Uh, but it was fun to go through that process and have that experience. And, and, and get screwed by the network. You'll <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear that term a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> screwed by the studio or screwed by the uh, network. I did some 3D projects I, I, in Halifax. Uh, so. Bob the Builder was in there. And uh, Space Ranger Roger. And then, what was the other one? Uh, no, it was, I um, can't remember what that was. <laughs> but it was a Hanson thing. Doozers, thank you. All right, Brian. So now, now you've got to give a quite detailed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, so when yeah, did you yeah, when did you start at and you're a Sheridan as well? I'm Sheridan. Yeah. yeah. And I, then when did you start at Nelvana? Well, I, I went to Sheridan in '77, uh, uh, the year that Star Wars came out. Mm -hmm. And I should preface it by saying that I'm a Star Wars geek. Uh, loved Star Wars as soon as it came out, and uh, I remember it came out in May, and that uh, that Halloween uh, I made a costume of Luke Skywalker. Oh, nice. And my, my best friend dressed up as Darth Vader. Now this is before cosplay was big. Yeah. Uh, we made his mask out of cardboard and then coated it in fiberglass and spray painted it. Wow. And we made our lightsabers out of flashlights and golf tubes. <laughs> and, uh, and we went to high school at the time and uh, I think we were grade 10 or 11. And uh, you weren't allowed to get dressed up for Halloween at that time. And we walked in proud as could be as Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. But what was great about it was, it was like Spaceballs. My friend was like this tall. <laughs> <laughs> Darth Vader, I love Luke Skywalker. And we immediately got kicked out of the school. Um, so so that's, that's to preface my, my Star Wars uh, geekiness. Um, so then I went to Sheridan College in, in 77. Uh, I dropped out of second year, got a job at Nelvana working on rock and roll as an assistant animator, in between her first and then assistant animator. I think some of the earliest stuff I did was with you, Larry, on uh, Kick After the Ball Game. We were a team. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, after rock and roll, uh, in 19, uh, immediately after rock and roll finished, uh, Christmas of 82, I got a phone call uh, early the next year, 83, to come into the studio. Out of the blue, she called me up from uh, uh, Dale. Dale Cox, yeah. right. called me on production manager, he said, you need a job? And I said, yeah, I need a job. Yeah. Well, come on down to the studio. So I came down and uh, she walked me to the back of the studio and sat me down at a desk, didn't tell me what I was working on, and said, someone will be by to talk to you. And they plunked a script down in front of me and I looked at it and went, okay, well, what, what am I supposed to be doing? And someone else, I think Pete Sauter came up and uh, explained what was going on and said, you're the character designer for the show. And I went, oh, okay. Open it up and start your gadget. 
And so uh, I I'm, I'm, was the primary character designer for all the secondary characters. So Penny Brain, Quimby, and uh, Gadget were already pre-designed. I did everything else in, in the show. So if uh, Penny had a little buddy that she ran into, I designed that character. All the mad agents are my designs. Uh, animals are all my designs. And then kind of Brain was in a costume, that was my design. So then after that, uh, I went to we, uh, what happened right after Gadget? Gadget? Well, I got burnt out on Gadget. I uh, went to LA to surf for a little while. Um, came back and then I was a pizza delivery specialist uh, <laughs> for a year. Uh, and then finally got a call uh, about Ewoks and Droids. Mm -hmm. And I had never done, I was a layout artist and I had never done layouts before. I was always character animation or yeah. character design. Walked in, did a, a test for show three on Ewoks. Uh, it was one of the Duloc scenes and uh, immediately got the job. And so uh, I became a layout artist on Ewoks and Droids. And that must have been pretty cool if you were a Star Wars geek to begin with. This is, this is the thing that I tell people. It never registered in my brain that, holy crap, you're working on Star Wars. This is so <laughs> cool. You should be so, this is so amazing. All I was concerned about was the fact that I wasn't delivering pizza anymore. <laughs> and that I was working in animation. Yeah. That's, that's what consumed my thought. We've got our final panel of the day. Um, and I'm sitting here with Roger Christian, who um, I, I think for a long time, you kind of, uh, your work went uh, underappreciated. Uh, and, and, and it seems like more recently, uh, we're finding out more and more about the work you did. Um, for those who, who don't know, I'll let Roger talk about himself a little bit more. But um, Roger won the Oscar in the, for set decoration on Star Wars, along with the, the team you worked with. Uh, and he was really responsible for not just creating that lived-in universe that we're all so familiar with, uh, but then populating it with the, the vehicles, the props, uh, and even the droids that, that live there, and is really responsible for that, that look we all know in Star Wars. Um, I was speaking with Roger before, and I think uh, we're talking about that we're all pretty hardcore Star Wars fans here, uh, but even as a kid, I think Star Wars was one of those things where uh, what really drew myself and a lot of people I know to it was the universe. It wasn't just the characters. It wasn't just, I want to be Luke Skywalker or I want to be Han Solo. It's, I would love to go live in that space for a little while. I'd love to go to that cantina or drive a land speeder or uh, you know, have a Wookiee co-pilot. Uh, it wasn't just about, uh, it was more of an open thing where you could picture yourself in there. Uh, you knew it was a universe from which like a million stories could come out of. Uh, and I think a lot of that's thanks to Roger and, and George, of course, as well. Uh, so we're really honored and, and uh, lucky to have you here today. So thank you very much. So it's good to be here. <laughs> So uh, let's rewind way back to, um, I guess, what would it have been, 1975, that you first met George Lucas? How did, uh, how did he first approach you? Um, I'll compress it. The Alan Ladd hired George Lucas because they all wanted to revive the studios because they were all suffering. Yeah. He came in with his... Alan Ladd's worst nightmare, which was a science fiction fantasy story for children that there was no marketplace for at the time. Yeah. So the Fox board um, estimated the film would gross $12 million. <laughs> and in those days, they divided it by three. So they said to George, if you can make your film, you can do it for $4 million. Yeah. You'll make it. Gary Kurtz's budget was at $8 million in America, which is still nothing. <laughs> but, and that was based on them doing T THX, yeah. doing it for real. Um, and it just coincided with UK was exactly half the cost of America at the time. We had a lot of stages for you, whereas yeah. people were not making films so much there. And um, I was working with John Barry, the designer, on this huge film, uh, Lucky Lady in Mexico, but we were adapting old Mexican buildings into rum running buildings from the 20s, 30s. That was written by Gloria Willard Hike, who wrote American Graffiti. Oh, okay. And were friends of George's, and yeah. John Barry and I have become great friends. They were wonderful, Gloria and Willard. So they said to George, listen, you should fly down and meet them, because they're doing what you want. They're doing a spaghetti western 
but as a 2030s movie. Yeah. And so George flew down with Gary. I was set dressing, uh, set decorating a salt factory. There was a whole action scene in the where they had salt was a big commodity then. And George arrived in the plaid shirt, jeans. <laughs> We were all like students, and he came across. He actually grabbed a shovel and helped me shovel. Yeah. Um, he said, "I want to make the science fiction film," and kind of I just instinctively said, "You know, I didn't really like Flash Gordon very much. The look of it, I didn't like any science fiction films. I said they're not real, and my idea is an old car in a garage and it's dripping oil and it's being yeah. repaired." I realized later when I read the script, I'd exactly described them in any of the the perfect thing. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that was it. No, John Barry was number one hired. Jeffrey Unsworth, the DP, who in the end couldn't do it. And I was number three hired on the film. And we were just told to be in London on August the 1st to start work. And, and like, did you trust George to? Yeah, because I'd seen THX, I was really impressed by it. To me, this was real science fiction. Oh, okay. uh, so you were on board right from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. I and mean, he did it with no money. And, yeah. um, and he'd made American Graffiti, which is just, it's a great movie. I, yeah. I thought this guy's really good. And George never said much, especially in those days. Um, when we got to London, we didn't know the budget, we just know what it was. We had a meeting in 20th Century Fox and what it, it was announced the budget was $4 million. Yeah. Gary Kurtz was still trying to get it down to that. And um, John Barry and I went, George paid us, Fox weren't in, they wouldn't give us any money for four months. John, uh, George paid so George was really out of his pocket for yeah, that and initial work. John Barry, myself, and Les Diddy, one art director, were based in the tiny studios in London, and um, <laughs> I did my breakdowns, and I looked at John, I said, I, yeah, I can't make this. I think I had $200,000 for this huge film. And, um, but me being me, I thought, right, I'm gonna find a way around this, because I'm gonna make this film. And the first thing, I mean, the way it led to how the whole thing looked, because George always, I mean, my mentor was Kurosawa. Yeah. So I love Kurosawa, and every time he mentions spaghetti westerns, every spaghetti western he only did is based on a Kurosawa movie. Okay. Same story. So um, I kind of thought, okay, I'll, I know what I'll do. I went to a gun hire place that they were friends of mine, and that's where you hire for any movie in Britain. Yeah. And I got a um, Sterling submachine gun, because I loved them. This is science fiction, I could just use this. But I stuck T-strip around it, got super glued, stuck some sights I found in there. He kept saying that uh, Han Solo was a, a cowboy, basically. Yeah. And I found this Mauser in there that I thought, well, that's a sci-fi gun, look at it. Stuck the sights on the top mm -hmm. and made a call to John Barry and said, you better <coughs> bring George here, because I hadn't told anyone what I was doing. Yeah. And that was the point. I, I thought, I'll be fired or I'll be hired. <laughs> <laughs> And, and for visual reference at that point, like, did you have any, were there the Nothing. Ralph Macquarie uh, yeah. paintings? And yeah. That would be about, and then descriptions from the script, and that would be it? Yeah, there was the script, and um, there were six Ralph Macquarie paintings that came, and oh, in fact, six, six. Ralph's genius, and when, when this eventually comes out, the Galaxy Build on Hope, the documentary properly, which I think you've seen it. Yes, yeah. Um, I give back credence to Ralph McCurry because I think he's the forgotten hero of this and his in those six paintings were Star Wars. Everything. C three PO R two D two, Chewbacca, the Tunisia, Tatooine, I mean everything is in there. And such a unique club from everything that had gone before. Yeah, he's a genius. You know Ralph no one knows, but he used to work for Boeing. He, he drew jet engines and things. So his things worked, you know, you could believe it. But um, at the same time, well, George appeared, I didn't get fired, and he <laughs> stayed with me, and we made Princess Leia's gun together. He, he got yeah. his fingers burned like mine, was super good. <laughs> just like sitting at the table with yeah. a bunch of parts and yeah. stuff? Yeah. No, I just, just went round finding, and I found a, 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 a practice pistol, and I said, this looks pretty interesting, with a long barrel, and then he helped me go through, and we found a piece for the end of it, and we did it like that. Wow. The entire Star Wars was made like that. Um, at the same time, 
John Barry and Les and I said if he doesn't half R2D2 working, there isn't a movie, they're not going to green light it, because there was no CGI then, there was very primitive um, <coughs> radio control. Yeah. So, what was the, from the beginning, did you know you were going to be putting a person inside R2? That was the only way, yeah, our reference was Daleks. Okay, yeah. See, so Daleks, I don't know if anyone knows here Daleks from um, Doctor Who, they have a toilet plunger on the <laughs> yeah. that you, <laughs> and it could be foiled <laughs> by stairs. Yeah. But everyone believed them. Yeah, they were always like scared when they came <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. So we thought, okay, that's the only way to do it. And we hounded George, and eventually hired Kenny Baker, who was a comedian. He had his own little comedy show, and he was strong. Yeah, because we knew this was not going to be an easy job. So how did you start making art? Well, we went to Robert Watts, the line producer, and said, I haven't got any money, there's nothing. So I hired Bill Harmon, who made the props for Monty Python, who really had no money. They had <laughs> so little money, they couldn't even have horses on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they could only find them by using coconuts. He's here, I filmed them, the actual ones. Yeah. Um, he had some wood at home in the garage, so we managed to <coughs> marine ply so he could bend it round and then he said, Roger, I can't make a top, I can't do that. So yeah. I, I scrounged in the uh, in a lamp scrapyard <laughs> and found a top that matched exactly. So I, I went back to Bill and I said, if I go and ask for this, they're going to charge me quite a few pounds, so yeah. you go. <laughs> and he got it for 10 shillings and sixpence, he said. <laughs> so, <laughs> And that bit it, and then he said, I can't do the little hands on the front. I carved those at home with a pen knife. He gave me a knife. Yeah, those. those I made those at home that night. And I got little pieces from a, a junkyard, which were the, these were the lights off an old Dakota airplane. I didn't know what it was. I just yeah. found shapes that I liked and filters and things. And they're still there. I mean, that was R2D2. And Kenny, couldn't move it. <laughs> yeah. So we like in the actual wood one in this one. Oh, and wow. then so I asked him to bring his boots in, and we stapled the boots in the bottom of these legs. Yeah. And he could wobble it, but he still couldn't move it. And I bought a fighter pilot's harness mm -hmm. in the junk that I bought. Yeah. And Bill stapled it inside, and he could wear it like a rucksack. <laughs> and he did three steps before he fell over. <laughs> but. It's the most auspicious moment on Star Wars. It's George was there because we knew he had a movie. Yeah, the, 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 you kind of it never the hardest task. Yeah, it never worked. It, the radio control. Yeah, was, I, before we went to Tunisia, I'm jumping forward, but yeah. as we're on R2D2, John Barry called me into the office and said, listen, I don't believe John Steers. I don't believe it's going to work. You're going to be miles out in the desert. Make a lightweight one out of fiberglass yeah. that you can pull on fishing wire. Okay, yeah. And the first shot we ever did was R2-D2 with the Aunt Beryl and uh, Uncle Owen buying the robots. Yes, yeah. He came, crashed over, banged <laughs> another one, it, nothing. George went cut. Gary Kurtz said, where's the monofilament one? He was the only one who knew. Les yeah. Dilly, who's with me, who's English, very English, Albrecht, said, what's monofilament? <laughs> so, <laughs> so fishing wire. And from then on, the three-legged version, nearly all of it, we put a board down, put sand on the edge of it so you yes. wouldn't see it, and we pulled it along on fishing wire. So how many R2, R2s did you have for filming? There was the Kenny Baker one. The two-legged, yeah. The three-legged one. The three-legged one we built, and a few, and one that they'd converted or the one that went wrong, the one going, which is part of the plot. Yeah, okay. The I mean, that, <laughs> they set that up to do the shot. Um, and there was all this kind of hanging their heads in the uh, special effects department. And, and we looked inside, it, and Kenny couldn't get in it. <laughs> and it was filled with um, electronic radio control equipment. Yeah. And it didn't work. And they'd forgotten to put the. Um, the explosion of Oh, really? Yeah, so we quickly got our one, repainted it, stuck a different top on it, and we pulled it along, and that's how that went. This is a, a kind of little potted version of how Star Wars was made. But um, <coughs> it, 
it kind of developed from the moment whereby I got all those guns ready. I mean, I, it, it, Ralph McCory had actually painted a, uh, a blaster in C-3PO's hands. Oh, okay. And I found the bowcaster with the balls on the end, and I yeah. thought, this is far more suitable for a, a <laughs> seven-foot yeah. monkey. So I took to George, and uh, he changed the script for that one. And then I was driving around London thinking, how am I going to do this film? What am I going to do to make this Millennium Falcon? Because I knew this was coming up. Yeah, and pretty pivotal part of the <laughs> movie. Yeah. yeah, so I kind of thought I'd been in a submarine and I'd seen uh, Dr. Strange of the B-52 bombers. Yeah. And I thought, you know what, if I buy airplane junk, I could strip it down and make the sets out of it. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to John Barry and George and Gary and kind of own up and say, look, I can't afford to make it and then we don't have time. Mm -hmm. I got an idea, only because George had made THX and because he's independent filmmaker, he yeah. said, go and try it. And, so, he, and I think he trusted you to, by that then, point. Yeah, because I'd made a lot of the guns by then. We got yeah. R2D did working. We'd, we'd got, we designed C-3PO's head. Um, we, we had a brilliant sculptress doing those, and we started with 12 heads in clay, okay. and it came down to two, mm -hmm. and then down to one, and it didn't work. He had the rough Macquarie eyes, which were very small, Yes. and we're all looking at it, and um, Bill Harmon, the carpenter, they they always bought sausage sandwiches in the morning, okay. <laughs> and tea. So there were two old English pennies, on the counter, and George picked them up and stuck them in his eyelids, and yeah. there he was. They always see three. Oh, the clay oh, That's where it comes from. Yeah, they're exactly the size of pennies. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it it kind of got into the studio. Then they finally said they would back it right before Christmas, and we started work in January the sixth, and we were shooting in mid March in Tunisia or yeah. Uh, yeah. John Barry's genius, he designed um, The Little Prince for Stanley Donan, mm -hmm. a new Tunisia, and again, the, the same thing, how can we make Tatooine real and no one will question it, so yeah. there it was, Tunisia. Really, all I had to do was dress it, stick panels that we made in the walls, yeah. put the moisturizers in every set, we had about two that we moved around, mm -hmm. and um, we kind of, made it work there with a few extra domes on the top. Um, and Les and I were sent down there. There is, I was showing this here, when they go into the cantina, yeah. there's a crash spaceship. Yes. So <laughs> this came about because there's an olive tree in that set. Oh, really? And we said, this is a farmer's life. We can't <laughs> take it down, they're very poor. So John Barry had this idea, well, we'll just do a Boeing 747 size spaceship. Mm -hmm. They thought I was nuts. I was taking okay. down scrap in trucks down to Tunisia because yeah. there was nothing there that we could use. Well, so how long were you in London basically creating things that would be packed up and shipped down to Tunisia? Right. Um, a month and a half, two months. Oh, so you didn't have a lot of time no. to, to and create that many things. When you think about all the weapons, yeah. uh, 3PO, R2, and the atmosphere was horrible. And I, I tell this story happily now. George is now being more open about it because nobody in the art departments or any of the crews understood what we were doing. They thought it was a part of crap. And, uh, American culture then was pretty much in the toilet. It was just Western. So anything American coming in was kind of looked down on. Okay. And um, in fact, the day second day when we went to the studios they had me lay out all the weapons we'd made george and i and everything was put on there yeah. and they came down this whole group of super serious britons yeah threw the stormtroopers blaster at me and said this is absolute crap <laughs> you know we're making big science fiction film for yeah. a hollywood director and went off to get me fired and it kind of uh, we'd become friends with George by then, and I was doing my dream job. I mean, you can imagine, even if I had no yeah. money, I didn't care, and we were going to make it. So we just stuck together and got it done. And Tunisia was amazing to be there, very, very difficult 
the storm on the fourth day brought everything down and we had to rebuild it. Everything. Yeah, so uh, I remember hearing about that basically, I guess you guys had gotten there and had, you hadn't started filming yet. But you no, started we were setting building, up all the sets. We were there building the, the huge sound crawler. That was the oh, biggest okay. set we built. Yeah. You, you built kind of the first 25% of the Yeah. Event. Yeah. And um, that the shots, which are salt flats, so basically, when it rained like that, yeah. no one could walk. It was just mud, and it dried in two days. It's so uh, dry down there, but we had to stop shooting and wait for that. That's a funny story there of um, yeah. the um, building the, this sand crawl that was still huge. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it wood or what's it? It was yeah. wood and slats and um, pieces of, but all built yeah, on, on um, tubing, on okay. scaffolding. And had you brought those pieces? From yeah, everything had to come. This yeah. was the pressure because yeah. we were to shoot the end of March. Everything took six weeks to get there in trucks across wow. all these different countries. So John Barry's genius, he would design pieces that fitted in other pieces. pieces. Oh, it was like a Tetris of Yeah, it was yeah. like a, yeah, there was a Tetris packing in there, so everything. And then, as I said, I was bringing junk, which they thought I was nuts, <laughs> but I knew I needed it. There's nothing I could do. Yeah. The, the, we were on Tazer uh, right on the Algerian border. I went there, it's just a ditch and a barbed wire. Yeah. Um, huge army convoy arrived and thank God Robert Watts, the line producer, spoke he's fluent French. Oh, okay. They arrived um, accusing us of building a war weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Which was slightly true. But yeah, yeah, but it had real wars. Yeah. <laughs> they, because we found out the oil fields ran under the border between Tunisia. They thought we, they, Tunisians were building a machine that was a war <laughs> machine. They were going to go to war and get the oil. Took a lot of convincing, but <laughs> because they didn't know what a movie was, yeah. they had no idea. But uh, we got it done. Mm -hmm. And um, like, what what would be the size of the crew that was down in Tunisia? Um, I would say it's ninety people. Oh wow! So that you must have been a uh, well, stuck out like a sore thumb. But like, that's a lot of people to bring into. You were going into yeah. really small town areas and that sort of thing. Where did you guys actually stay and? and well, we were supposed to stay in Tozer, but Zeffirelli was down doing the Jesus, his Jesus of Nazareth series, so they took all the hotel rooms because they had money. We had <laughs> so we had to stay in a place called Nefta. It was very rough, but it's yeah. okay. And it was a two and a half hour, two, two and a half mile drive from there into where we built Luke's homestead and, and the sand crawl. All of that was in one area. Yeah. And. Um, it's another funny story, but um, that first morning, because the special effects, John Steers, he, he's a genius, he was very good, but he was too full of himself, saying, oh, it's gonna be work, it'll be fantastic. The first, when R2-D2 crashed up the first shot, he went in front of the crew and said, it's the taxis, they're upsetting my airwaves. <laughs> there was donkeys, <laughs> there was, Two old cars with carts in in Tozer, which yeah. was a long way away. So um, it, it kind of it, George always says he got about twenty five percent of what he actually went to go and film. But yeah. he's such a precise editor that he knew exactly which piece he could use. And in fact, if you watch the film, knowing what I'm saying, if you watch that scene with Uncle Owen and and uh, Luke. And R two D two R two D two is hardly in it, but it's all about him. Yes, yeah. Because he didn't work. <laughs> That's why. If you watch carefully, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Now, the, like when you mention it, and I think of the actual shots. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. He's not, not much in it. Just enough. Static. Enough to establish him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I guess one of the most. Uh, well, I should probably go back to the Ludwig Falcon there, but one of the most. Uh, Iconic for me uh, vehicles is the land speeder, and um, uh, that went through a couple of iterations, right? How was well, that? That, that also, we started in these studios because yeah. we knew this was never going to work. Yes, yeah, so you would would be able to make it. it yeah. yeah, and so we got Bill Harmon. He brought in wood from home, and he bought some polystyrene, um, 
and we built one to John Barry's specifications because when you read the script, there was R2D2, C3PO, yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke. Yeah, a four-seater. Yeah, yeah. So we built nice a four-seater yeah. and then George came and said, no, no, he would have an old two-seater battered little sports car. So we, and to make it look right, Bill had wheelbarrow at home and he yeah. got three of the wheelbarrow wheels and we stuck those on it and we got it down to the right size um, and again it sums up Star Wars. Gary Kurtz's wife was there that day, she'd come to visit. They took it for a test drive yeah. because um, the special effects boys had given us an old Volkswagen chassis okay. and Bill Harmon, they cut off the front and put a motorcycle wheel and bars on the front and well it together so we would give an idea of what we were trying to do. They drove it up this alleyway and it crashed, the wing fell off. <laughs> and Gary Kurtz's wife said, this ain't Hollywood, is it? <laughs> but it worked, you know, it was a way to do it. And then in the studios, I, I'd actually seen these little tiny sports cars called Ogle that were tiny, beautiful cars on yeah. the road. They were near the studio, and because there wasn't time to do it, um, they farmed it out to them. They used the Reliant Robin, which is a three-wheeler, which is famous yeah. for Mr. B. Yeah, yeah. And they cut it off the top. And in fact, if you look inside the dashboard of the land speeder, yeah. it's the same as the Reliant Robin. We didn't change it. We had the same steering wheel. I just stuck bits on it. Oh. And um, we tried a hovercraft. Oh, really? like, yeah, we can't, yeah, we tried it. Wow. Thought, how are we going to make this work? And so they, there was rotoscoping at the time, and George felt he could probably rotoscope out the wheels. So what exactly does that mean for... Oh, it's the same as animation, that you go in and hand paint the frame oh. on film. Yeah. Um, but I, I had an idea, and I suggested, why don't we hang a mirror that's 45 degrees mm -hmm. under it, and it'll reflect the desert. And in the distance, when you're looking out, always on those heat and the shots, there's yeah. always a mirage. Yeah. And I got an old brush from one of the um, Tunisians, and we hung that on the front, fastened it, so it kicked a bit of dust, and it actually worked. Amazingly well, yeah. 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 He's, he's rotoscoped afterwards, he's done more. And then for it to land, they built a massive long tube on a stand, and it was anchored onto it, the land speeder, so every time it's in close-up landing, it would float. So and that's why when, when you see guys, people getting in and out of it, it's yeah, usually it's, kind of yeah. cut off the full land speeder. But, yeah. no. but it gives that effect of yeah. it actually floating. Yeah. Cool. And so did you have two bodies? Like yes. That was a completely yeah. separate one. Yes. One. Yeah. It's amazing the amount of stuff you guys created in that short amount of time to not just to do yeah. all of them, but to do two of them or something. Yeah, because well, they, they were all needed in Tunisia, you know. We only, we had, I think, um, very short time. I think we had six weeks, Les and I, to get everything ready mm -hmm. for shooting. That was it. And uh, the big skeleton in the Dune Sea? Well, that was an accident. John Barry had actually drawn a skeleton in one of his drawings. Mm -hmm. And we all said, that's a great idea. And I said, oh, I can't afford that. I'm not going to make one of those. The prop master in, in the studios came to me one day and said, listen, I'm clearing out. I've got to throw everything away in the attic because I need the space. I'm expanding. Go and have a look, boy. <laughs> and um, that, I'll just go back. He was um, the huge property master, did David Lean's films, all of these. Frank, he was a wonderful man, one of the few really kind of responsible really for running an army and he yeah. helped to make this work. When my, he asked me, he called me boy, <laughs> he was so young, well, what do you want boy? And I said, strip the um, prop room out, leave it empty, I just need tools and I, I'm going to bring in scrap and we're going to break it down and do the sets. I'm standing there next to him when this low loader backs in, it was yeah. a 16 wheeler with, there were Rolls Royce engines tied on it, there was a mountains I bought so much. He didn't <laughs> so look much at me, garbage. It was, yeah, he, looked, he didn't look at me, I just heard, you know you're a bad boy. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
But then he said, okay, boy, in my office, five minutes, I've got the tea on, you tell me what you need. And that's how we did it. So um, uh, it kind of somehow got made with Frank kind of behind everything, and I've lost my train of thought there for what your question was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the skeleton. The skeleton. So he said, go and look up in the attic, and yeah. I went in the attic, and I found that full-sized dinosaur yeah. from this previous movie, and I said, what are you going to do? He said, it's going in the junk. So I got it down. There's a photograph of it. We laid it out in the, um, in the, um, Is it in the, the bank of the parking yeah. lot, and we took it down, and I put it in the desert, and um, it, it gives a history to that planet that something's there. I mean, it, I, yeah. we never realized it would turn into the great dragon and <coughs> all of this yeah. whole history, like a lot of things we did. But at the end of it, then I said to Robert Watts, what should we do? And he said, leave it. I can't afford to take it home. I don't have the money to truck it back, leave it. Well, some people eventually did go in and, and bring some of it. Uh, well, it's in the documentaries. David West Reynolds, who became the head of literature at Lucasfilm, mm -hmm. he became that because he's an archaeologist, he's a Star Wars geek. Yeah. He thought all these sites should be there for preserved and mm -hmm. people could visit. And he asked Lucasfilm, they said, sorry, everything got thrown away. No one believed in this film. Everything yeah. got thrown out. Rick McCollum was putting his hair out. We have to go back on Phantom Menace. So David, on his own money, got a little crew and went, because he's an archaeologist, he had every clip of the film, he sourced by yeah. um, reference every shot we did, every angle, everything of every yeah. set. And that's when uh, Rick McCollum remembered his name and said, get that kid up here, yeah. I think he's got something, and he went down and showed them. So he, in the documentary I've done from the book, um, I've got David and all his footage and how he went and found it, and the hardest thing for him was that skeleton. Yeah, so I imagine, you know, as opposed to like um, some of the rocky terrain, like where, where R2 goes through, which is easier to distinguish, it's just all desert. Right? Yeah, it's all desert. Kind of the same. Yeah, and we, we had to go in from the back, we forbade, because on film sets, it's traditional. You set everything up, you get it all ready, and then the crews come in. They all start walking in and go, oh, look at this, and everything. So we banned everybody. Because uh, you'd see all the footprints. Yeah, we had to preserve that sand. So yeah. um, we, they built it from the back. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's, I mean, there's a few bones in Rancho Obi Wan. Mm -hmm. um, funny enough, David found the cantina door that we built. Yes. And it was being used as a door to hold the chickens in. <laughs> so he got it cut up, got home. He, he, yeah. he was even then sweating because he had to pay $100 for it. <laughs> um, and then the domes, you know, we added the domes. Yeah. That was in the back as a, as a water trough for the goats <laughs> upside down. So everyone asked me about that. But I think, you know, these are very poor farmers. I think yeah. something we did is... Um, well, just like you, they found a use for everything. Yeah, right? and, uh, yeah. yeah. Like us, it was the same. Mm -hmm. I found a use for everything I could find. Yeah. The Millennium Falcon, so you had to build um, a cockpit and then kind of the, the back room with the chess table yeah. and uh, uh, where Luke does his lightsaber training. Um, uh, and are, that was that one of your favorite sets? Or? Yeah, the, the yeah. hold was my favorite, but uh, that was the first set we built, was the cockpit. Okay. And again, because of lack of money, there's only two angles on it, looking out mm -hmm. of hyperspace and looking in. Yes. Yeah. Um, they'd hired um, uh, one of the art, art directors from 2001, mm -hmm. Harry Lang, and I kept watching him, and he was doing it beautifully, like 2001. I kept coming into it, saying, Harry, I'm going to mess this up. You know that, don't you? And he looked at me, <laughs> what is this kid doing? Yeah. And eventually he said, oh, I finished. And I said, good, OK. And I got old fighter pilot seats, and we stuck yeah. those in. And we managed to make all the stuff working. And um, I interviewed his son um, for the documentary. And he said, funny enough, after that, Harry 
He said, I was 16, Harry asked me to come with him with a wheelbarrow and we went to a scrapyard in London and were pulling out pieces like you did for yeah. sets after that on another film, yeah. So, yeah, he, he kind of worked out that was Star Wars, that's how it should be. And that set, and then the, the main one that tested my kind of resilience <laughs> to giving up was the whole area. Yeah. Because all right. John Barry just built the walls and that was it. Okay. So I had to make this look like a ship. Yeah. And um, I started layering. I bought um, PVC drain pipes and you could get it from a quarter of an inch up to two foot, three foot sewer pipes. I had a whole stack of it. Yeah. It was cheap. That was going in. We found a telephone exchange that was being modernized. My buyer oh, bought a lot. That, that. He bought everything. Yeah. And I was sticking those cables in. It just looked terrible. <laughs> and I, I was encouraging my prop gang to keep going. And we kept going and kept going. And I yeah. was praying no one would come on the set and look. But the moment we kind of got it finally in, and I put on some oil drips, and uh, we put in old aging and stuff, suddenly everyone was coming on the set and I could tell then we'd won because yeah. they were kind of thinking how did you make this ship this is real you know mm -hmm. and I realized then that this silly idea I'd had driving yeah. around London yeah. actually had worked. Did, uh, were you there with George saw it yeah. for the first time? No I showed him I had to show him they asked me to take him down and show him the cockpit. And then how what was his he yeah. just smiled. I mean, I knew then, that's it. Don't and it's that's a big me. reaction. For yeah. The, for and that, the only thing then I said was, look, I, I like to personalize things. And I think this is, he's a gambler, and he has all this stuff. I think we should hang some dice in there because yeah. being in America, everyone had dice hanging in their cars. Uh, yeah, and nice. um, George said, oh, that's a good idea. I said, it would be good luck. It was good luck for you on, on graffiti because yeah. it was in Ron Howard's car they were hanging. Yeah. Um, and I got six pairs, chose the little, he chose the little tiny silver ones. Mm -hmm. They went in. They're in <coughs> one or two shots on Star Wars and the DP got fed up with them and pulled them out and they never went back. But we all remember them as, as being there all the time, yeah. I think. Some, I was on a um, Ask Me Anything Reddit and talking about this and somebody said, have you just seen the Rat Vanity Fair cover? Mm -hmm. There they are. Yeah. For Phantom Menace. For, uh, for um, uh, sorry, the Force for, Awakens. For Force Awakens. Yeah. There they are. Yeah. And apparently AJ is pretty detail oriented. Mm -hmm. JJ. And he'd gone out and had them source same ones that he found. Yeah put them in, that scene got cut out. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it, but it, they came back with, it's such an emotional moment when yeah. uh, uh, Leia gives it to Luke. Yes, yeah. Well, and with all the new content that, that's out there that's reusing <coughs> the stuff you made, in, like, you know, so much more stuff has been done on the Millennium Falcon since you first created it. What's it like to, uh, to see, I guess, other people's work of your work. I just, God bless Dave Filoni every day. <laughs> I think this man has brought back everything that was Star Wars from everything that was in for The Mandalorian, and he's detail obsessed and mm -hmm. has revived that world again because it, it was, it's always there. I think we, it's kind of set the standards for science fiction that yes. you have to believe it now. Mm -hmm. um, but. You know, do you like look at the Millennium Falcon cockpit in The Force Awakens or something and be like, eh, that button should be there, <laughs> or, uh, that, that part needs to be a bit bigger, or... But it does say in the script, <laughs> Luke says this is a pile of junk. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I was following the script, but no, I, I kind of look at, I see, yeah, I've always loved and I support this world because I think George single-handedly has given the world something to believe in, mm -hmm. globally, every doesn't matter what country or religion or anything. Yeah. Maybe religions aren't engrossing the young so much. He's given the planet something to believe in because he created a myth. And it's exactly the right, it's good defeats evil and it's yeah. fun and it's 
um, and I just support it all the time because I think we need it, especially now in the world and the way it is. But I, you know, I, I did like what JJ did on, on his two. We didn't, none of us liked the other one. I don't want to say about it, but um, I just thought he went against everything that George had ever kind of very carefully had considered in mythology and the whole thing and the stories George had mapped them all out whether he was making it up as he went along but those six episodes are all mapped out yeah did George like drop hints to you about the rest of the story like as you were working yeah on, but on Star Wars? Wars? yeah but his his idea he told me he wanted to do nine mm -hmm. what he wanted to do was a three before way before Star Wars kind of much more of a um, of a a kind of samurai type movie. Yeah, you go way, way. You go, go way back yeah. to the origins. Yeah. But if you look at Return of the Jedi, mm -hmm. it's really, um, I always point this out, that, that it leads to the point where the son and the father, who hate each other and want to kill each other, finally get to that moment. Yeah. And like an animal kingdom, the young one gets the older one down. Yeah. And he switches off the lightsaber. He doesn't kill him. And um, Darth Vader removes, asks him to remove his helmet. And you know he's going to die because he can't breathe. Yeah. And all that's left is George's kind of Buddhism, if you like, which is compassion and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's the end, really, of that six. When you look at it as a fitting end. Yes. Well, it's. Uh the final battle, in a sense, is, is about one guy who won't fight. Yeah. Right, and that's yeah. the final fight, is, yeah. is not, not Yeah, fighting. which is the truth of the Jedi, and it comes from like the Shaolin monks who train. They're not trained to fight, they're trained to defend. Yes. They happen to be able to fight better than anyone else. <laughs> yes. But, um, that brings up, we haven't touched on lightsabers. Oh, lightsabers, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so where... Where in the timeline or in the process did uh, well, did Luke's lightsaber first get made? I couldn't make anything in the studio, so it was junk. I, I collected any yeah. junk, then my files were being shit loads of old. There were no computers then, but there were calculators and things. Yeah. And I was finding everything. I could not find anything that I felt would justify a weapon of the Jedi. Because you must have like a picture in your head of what this. Well, the, the well, only Ralph Macquarie painting is, yeah. in fact, the stormtroopers originally yes, had lightsabers, yes. but theirs were like lances that the um, medieval knights used. If you, there's a wonderful Macquarie yeah. painting. Yeah, and it's got points here on the Yeah, table. that's the only reference. Mm -hmm. My reference came because I grew up with myth and legend, got me through childhood, and King Arthur, and I, yeah. you know, I played Escalibur, and I was fighting all the time with it, so yeah. I knew this was that iconic kind of would be the icon of Star Wars if it ever worked. Yeah. I hadn't found anything and they were pressuring me because it was needed to hang on his belt. That's a pretty important ago. piece. <laughs> um, and I, I had to make Luke's binoculars, mm -hmm. which the, the only drawing I ever did ever was trying to work out what they would look like and I did drawings of those. Mm -hmm. and. I found three different camera parts and stuck them together with super glue and, and then yeah. I thought, you know what, I need to let the audience know this is binoculars. Yeah, to be so familiar I, but not familiar. So, so I went to the gun, uh, to, there's a camera hire shop in London that we got everything, runnings from, everything. Yeah. And so I went to buy those lenses. And I happened to be with the manager and I said, have you got anything? I have to make this kind of sword and everything. And he said, yeah. well, have a look under that shelf there there's some old boxes i don't know yeah. what's in them yeah and it was literally i pulled out this box and the music rises now and <laughs> yeah. it goes into slow motion yeah i know the, there was the the perfect thing, right? handles yeah. for the, the power packs for the um for, for the, the graphics camera yeah because yeah. they were the cameras used by um the um paparazzi in the 40s okay and so he had a lot of those mm -hmm. Um, and I just went, oh, I found it. And I just loved, you know, there's something about something designed for something else. You don't quite know what it is, but it had a firing button. It had, yeah. I ran to the office. I, I had some tea strip left over from 
I stuck around the um, stormtrooper. The stormtrooper rifle, yeah. yeah. Stuck seven of those around. I have to be breaking down a, um, a Texas instrument. I remember it, calculator. Um, the bubble strip that illuminated the numbers and, and magnified them. It fitted perfectly because I didn't like the grip. Yeah. And um, I called George over and said, you better come and have a look. I think I found it. So once you brought that back, was it like within a matter of hours you had yeah. kind of your finished product? <coughs> yeah. yeah. Straight away, I just yeah. stuck it in the super glue. I just finished it and called George over, and then he just wanted the clip on the end because it was to hang on his belt. belt. Um, and that was it. I made three because I had an idea because no one knew how to do the blade. Yeah. Um, and I, I experimented at art school, kind of, we were doing stuff for exhibitions, painting front projection paint on things that picked up light. Okay. So I suggested we put a rod in and paint it, the DP. Yeah. <laughs> that went up work and dismissed it. George said, try it. Yeah. And we did, and it worked. It picked up light. Mm -hmm. And the other decision we all made on Star Wars was the blades should act like swords. They shouldn't go through each other. Yeah. So they never do that yeah. in the entire Star Wars canon. Mm -hmm. So the sticks, when Obi-Wan and um, when, well, with Ralph and um, uh, with the, sorry, Dave Prowse and uh, yeah. Alec Guinness, yeah. they could hit each other. They were breaking them all the time. <laughs> really? They were just yeah, thin sticks, but it kind of worked. Yeah. Um, and well, I gave them something rather than yeah. them faking it. Yeah. Kind of and I interviewed David French. And so I, I got all these people before they pass away because this is Star Wars history. And as yeah. David West Reynolds said, I'm the only one who knows all these stories. Unfortunately, I had to write this book that kind of almost forced me because you know, even my son now, they see these huge Hollywood movies, but it came from a ragtag group of people with no money and a bit of a belief in something. And um, it's become that important that it it had to be put down for history. Yeah. So I interviewed him and then we talked about it and then we said, how many of the graphics handles went to the studio? How many did we buy? And he said, 33. You had 33. Yeah. And then I had David White, this um, English producer, interview him because we were stuck here with COVID. I couldn't go. And um, he said, oh, um, I, they paid 850 pounds. <laughs> for 33. Yeah. <laughs> imagine now. Yeah, imagine now what those ones, uh, those would be worth. Yeah. Uh, so that was the lightsaber. Wow. And then we made Alec Guinness's one for, because um, his was the first one that you see come out and light up and be used. Yeah. In the cantina. That was a piece of a Rolls Royce Merlin engine. Okay. And a piece of a grenade, it was a special grenade that could launch. Okay. So the main two components, if you look at it, that's a grenade and a, and a piece of a Rolls Royce Merlin uh -huh. engine stuck together. Okay. <laughs> and the only one we, that we was properly made and we got the special effects to do was Darth Vader's, which has a different end on it. Okay, so that one was more, bit less made from well, scratch, was, more yeah, manufactured? It was, kind of my idea that you have, they had such sophisticated weapons and yeah. the Death Star, and that, that's why the Tuscan Raiders, I gave them old kind of guns and, yeah. and a gaffy stick to hit people with. Yeah. Um, and so we thought his weapon should be a little bit more kind of industrial revolution kind of uh, yeah. technical style. Yeah. I mean, and uh, I guess gaffy stick, that's one of well, the that <laughs> weapons. Eh? That, uh, I found that and I thought, yeah. wow, this is perfect. And then I had to change anything, everything I had to change a bit. I didn't yeah. want to use it. So I found an old medieval mace that they manufactured. Yeah. Stuck that in the end. That's the only one we had. They made a mock up second one, but that one's in a kind of fight. But again, you know, I was like amazed in Boba Fett. To see it come back, to see it be like such a, a prominent. And, and have the history and how he made it. Yeah, it? yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's cool, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I could talk to you for like six <laughs> hours sitting here. About I, it. I have but, uh, done that. <laughs> um, let, let's skip ahead a little bit so that we we get uh, we get through all of that. When when did you see Star Wars? 
I um, I went from the set onto the final remake of Beau Jest. It was a Marty Feldman film in Spain that was just non-stop. Star Wars, I didn't have a day off in, in yeah. a year. No Sundays, nothing. And then that was the same. And then I went back, did Alien. Mm -hmm. um, and in between that, there was a crew screening in London. Okay. At the, um, it was a Tottenham Court Road, beautiful cinema. And I remember going in there and it's the same experience as they said before, that all of these naysayers, the crew, nobody knew. The moment that ship came overhead, the whole yeah. cinema went into a buzz. You could feel yeah. it. And, and even for people who had worked on it and kind of knew a bit of what was coming, it was still... Nobody did. They, they crazy. Uh, Les Dilly, who's you know, a dear, dear friend of mine, I've worked on several films. He was interviewed. He said, we thought it was a pile of rubbish, this whole junk. No one's ever going to see this film. Yeah. Nobody believed it. Um, and I think everybody kind of understood finally what George had done had in his head somehow and got and pulled it off. Well, what do you think is what's George Lucas's like superpower or special skill that that you know only he could have made that movie or something? What, what does well, he bring to several people? things. One is um, Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell is a great mythologist, and if you read Hero with a Thousand Faces, the, the book explains there are one basic story. Yeah. There's a thousand ways, I call it a billion ways now to tell it. Yeah. He mentored George into how to tell a myth and how Star Wars actually has keys buried in it, certain moments, Luke with the twin sons, the you know, dying, the defeat of the father the various different stages, those are all buried in there. Yeah. And George already had studied mythology, so he, he followed his teaching. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I think George's unique ability, he hired everybody, it wasn't just me, everybody he hired, even to the poster designers, were people who were young, mm -hmm. who'd done a bit of the job, yeah. but weren't going to go to him and say, no, God, that's not how we do it. We do it like this. This works. This wouldn't work. And because he was young himself, right? Yeah, we were like students, really. Um, and I think, look at it, um, Joe Johnson was a surfer. He just applied for a job. He didn't even know <laughs> that he was needed to draw anything. And um, Richard Edmund was doing army photography and various other things. That's yeah. what they were doing. Um, yeah. Our costume designer had never designed before. He was the wardrobe master on Gandhi and films like that. He yeah. had equipped an army, but he was always in my office plundering props and with John Barry getting advice on what science fiction could be. Yeah. So I think, and it's right across the board when you look at it with George, he always hired people who, and he says it himself, he wrote things that couldn't be done, but he hired people who'd figure it out how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it sounds to me like you always felt like he had your back, that yeah. that you could go out and, and, and make something and not worry about checking in or, or yeah. um, his reaction to you, but just go with what you thought was right. It's the kind of power of the universe that somehow him and my brain had the same idea, and yeah. John Barry too, and, and it connected by chance, universal chance, yeah. into one moment. And he, honestly, on Star Wars, he never ever declined anything I ever did. I showed him sets in Tunisia, props, everything we did. He, it was, there's one other story that I left the little um, communicator because it was going to be used later on by C-3PO in the uh, oh, in the Death Star, in the carburetor, I call it. <laughs> um, and I was with John Barry's office, and he was trying to design something, and I had some plumbing bits, so I took in some U-bends from under the sink, yeah. and the phone rang while I was undoing a piece of the thing, and uh, John said, He's decided he needs the um, communicator now on set. As a filter dropped into my hand, literally from this piece, and I went, oh, there it is. 
Stuck <laughs> one thing round, took it down, George took it, went, yep, and it went straight into the storm <laughs> and it's now one of the holy grails of Star Wars because no one's ever found it. So you're just grabbing reality pieces around you, basically. Yeah. And them up. I think it's just instinct. I, I kind of, it, 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 I embrace this world, and it, yeah. for me, it was, it was the best job I ever had. Yeah, and your brain was always going yeah. and looking for things. Yeah, and, and I understood it. I read a lot of science fiction yeah. books and stuff, so Tolkien, everybody. So yeah. I kind of, that world was inherent in me. Well, I want to leave some time for questions, and I know we're, we're getting late, but I do want to touch on um, The Phantom Menace again, because that you returned to Star Wars in The Phantom Menace. Uh, how did you get tapped to work as a well, second unit director on that? I was, I, I, after Life of Brown, after Alien, I thought, you know what, I've got to start directing now. So I, I went to film school, wrote Black Angel, and it was pure chance that it, George was fed up with the short film, because then there was no ads in cinema. There was a 25 minute short mm -hmm. and, the, and the main feature. That's all there was. Yeah. He was so fed up with the short film that Fox had put with Star Wars that he said, we can make one, yeah. because the British government had a grant of 25,000 pounds. So I wrote this medieval kind of epic of my own. And I didn't know, but it got sent to George, and he said, that's it, this will go out. Tell him, the government, I'm going to put it out when Empire Strikes Back. So that I got to make, and while I was waiting for a feature film money, George was doing Return of the Jedi, then called Revenge of the Jedi. Yeah. And um, he, George's least favorite film of all the Star Wars six is Empire Strikes Back. Really? Which a lot of fans love, it's but it's an adult film. film. Yes. Star Wars is aimed at nine to 12 year olds. Yes. That's George's audience. And he wanted Return of the Jedi back into that arena. Yeah. So he decided, he was doing second unit. Yeah. He decided he would go with the main unit all the time. So they called me and asked me if I were going to take over. So I did. <laughs> Return of the Jedi. And I, I mean, I got to shoot Harrison Ford coming out of the carpet because um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they couldn't schedule him in. I did loads of stuff on it that was really cool. Yeah. So we'd established. I was off. I was doing a film in Vancouver. I went down to San Francisco, and um, I was doing a sound mix down there. And they said, "Come and meet Rick McCullum. Mm -hmm. George wants to say hello." Mm -hmm. So I went, met them all. George, it was then he looked at Rick and said, you know, there are only five people stood with me on Star Wars and Roger was one of them. And, yeah. um, and did you even know he was working on a new Star Wars? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They then said, why didn't you come and see us in Leafton? And I said, yeah, yeah, like you do, you know, nothing <laughs> yeah. more of it. I went um, and I realized why I went. They said, go meet the designer. He was in a panic. He said, oh, I don't know how to deal with George. Well, I don't know how to I said, because he doesn't say anything. He said, no, he doesn't say anything. I said, no, he's not going to tell you how to do it. Do it and show him. If he likes it, he'll smile. If he doesn't, <laughs> he'll tell you. Yeah. And he'll change it. And that's how he works. It's just George's genius again. Mm -hmm. I did the same with the set deck, everybody. And then the DP was a friend of mine who I started in, in, in doing commercials. He said, why aren't you doing second unit, Roger? We're shooting this film in 12 weeks. It's a 24-week schedule. Mm -hmm. So I went in the office and I, I said to ask Rick McCullum, I said, is anyone doing second unit? No, no, he said, we don't need second unit. George can do it, we'll catch up afterwards. And he said, Ben Burt's gonna come over and do a few shots. Yeah. So I said, just put my name down. <laughs> um, and I got the call, <laughs> would you come please? Yeah. Sit down with us and they talked about second units and I told George how I did it to get my second units because most second unit directors want to get a job so they're trying to please a producer not the director. So they're trying to put their, so they're putting their, their stuff on it. it. I worked out how to get exactly what I needed with a small, mm -hmm. a, a, just a small portable camera and, and a little clamshell viewer. Okay. George just said buy those right now get those and then they finally said well are you serious can you do the second unit? And yeah. I said yeah I'd love to. And um, they said, well, 
and you start a meeting. And I said, well, I've just got to go and do sound. And they said, we're leaving the office now. You've got five minutes. You decide, and you start right now, or yeah. you can't do it. And I made a phone call, and then I understood when I said I'll do it because they took me into a room, and there was yeah. my office. There was an assistant <laughs> already there. And, uh, they were pretty confident you had some good Yes, they knew I wouldn't turn it down. <laughs> and um, the thing what I understood then, they, they trained the two crews that they used on Young Indy. They, they okay. leapfrogged each episode. Yes, yeah. So they were highly trained over years. Yeah. I had the other crew, and then they explained why I needed to do it, because we were going to be first unit on six different scenes that we had to go in first and set yeah. the lighting, everything. Okay. And the first thing was the, um, the scent with all the pods, yeah. so I had to go and shoot all of that yeah. with Terence Stamp. And, um, and I have to say, everyone says, oh, wasn't it changed now? It's like a huge film and everything. but. Uh, George put up his own money for it, yeah, and the budget was 110 million dollars. Rick McCullum put it to all the studios a script and said, "I need a budget for this to do it there in Hollywood." Each yeah. one came back over 400 million. So kind of the same story. It was yeah, made yeah, the same yeah. story, but they laughed because because of me buying scrap, which was cheap, no one yeah. wanted it, and then I did the same on Alien, yeah. even more there to do the whole Nostromo, it had started an industry, now you <laughs> could only, then I'm finding that you could only rent it, hugely expensive, Yeah, it was cheaper for Rick to fly aeroplane parts from the Texas graveyard yeah. in a huge transport plane to Tunisia, and oh, London, wow. yeah. um, but you know, it. I got a lot of uh, the Darth Maul, Ewan McGregor fight to shoot. I mean, I just can you imagine? I mean, it's, yeah, the, it's like the ultimate battle. Yeah, and, it, and it's just, you know, you're kicking yourself. And Ewan McGregor, I can't say exactly what he says because every swear word, my son gets five dollars. <laughs> um, I, I can find you a little bit if you need it. Ewan McGregor you kept walking out the stage going, I'm in fucking Star Wars. I'm in fucking Star Wars. And I was feeling the same. But I was directing it. We got, to, we got to film, and I told my unit, today you have to understand something in the Star Wars history. This is very important. And George never liked dealing with R2D2. Yeah, because <laughs> he said you deal with them. You've got more patience. And um, we got to shoot when R two D two and C three PO meet for the first time. And yeah. he's got no clothes. Yeah, on. he doesn't have the. Uh, and R two D two beeps at him and he says, "What do you mean naked?" Yeah. Carrie Fisher wrote that line, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and we, I got to film so much stuff, the pod race, I mean, and then George asked me what I was doing at the end. He had to go back for ILM. The pressure was so bad. Oh, really? Yeah. So I finished the movie. I did the last five to ten days of shooting. I wrapped Liam. I wrapped a lot of the actors mm. on the last days. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, it, it's like, you know, you're a kid in a candy box, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you spent a lot of years in that universe. Right? Yeah. All right. Well, before we go to questions, I want to, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, your book and about the uh, documentary so, as well? Um, if you look at all the official makings of, yeah. they're on Disney Plus now, John yeah. Barry and I never mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. And how this universe was created, because George was so consumed trying to pull this thing through that he didn't know, he just yeah. knows what we brought and everything. And then, if, when Phantom Menace in July, there was always a picnic at the ranch, mm -hmm. right from before it was built. It yeah. was tradition. Mm -hmm. I was there. This young kid came running down to me and said, Roger, you're a good question. I need to ask you questions. And this was David West Reynolds. Yeah. So I was answering questions nonstop. And he said, you've got to write this book. There's no one. You're the only one. John Barry's died. The, yeah. the other art directors had no clue. They were just lieutenants getting things made. Yeah. So um, he kind of almost forced me to take a year yeah. off and write everything down. And I remember everything. I have a, I've always kept fairly healthy and uh, eaten carefully and properly. And my memory is pretty much intact. So yeah. it all came tumbling out. I got Lucasfilm's permission 
I couldn't do it through Lucasfilm um, because they were deeply worried at the time. And David was put in charge of publicity for Phantom Menace. Yeah. And they were saying that George hadn't directed for 20 something years and they thought they might have lost the audience. Um, and Rick McCallum said that to me, if, as long as we can cover our costs, that's all we're looking at. We, really? We're very worried about it. Right. They didn't want to look back. Yeah. They wanted to look forward. Yeah. And they were trying to rebrand George because he was so shy. You, you never yeah. read anything about George. Um, yeah, I've seen interviews with No, him. very rare. Yeah. So I said, well, I, I really should do Alien as well because no one's ever written anything then about Alien. Yeah. Nothing had come out. So I thought, well, we'll do that. And I did the making of Black Angel, how I made that with a crew of nine and yeah. tried to be Kurosawa. And um, so it, it yeah, it got published. Um, and it's, it's called, still going. That's it's called Cinema it. Alchemist. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know alchemy, but, but it, not it's, super well. But yeah. Well, in ancient times, yeah. they tried to turn base metal into gold. Into gold so yeah. I use scrap metal, and I got an Oscar. So <laughs> that's, why I, oh, yeah. God, that's why I call it Alchemist. Um, but. Um, <coughs> I've since, during COVID, made a proper documentary, again, like Star Wars. We were stuck in Edinburgh and I for a year. They gave me a room in, in the post house. We yeah. couldn't travel. Yeah. I found an interactive um, studio in Toronto that made children's films. And I was able to link in London, LA, and different places. And we could put them in with me at the same time. And we could be live. Yeah. Um, Guillermo del Toro, who became a director because of Star Wars, said he wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. And because uh, of COVID, and I said, well, how are we going to do this? He said, I just meet me outside the Netflix stage at nine o'clock in the morning with one camera. That's all I had. He held the mic, I held the mic, yeah. and we were doing our interviews. He gave a, he's very erudite mm -hmm. and very, um, deeply kind of passionate and intelligent yeah. about, so he gives a really great through line on it. Yeah. Oops, sorry. And um, Gareth Edwards, to me, Rogue One is an ideal Star Wars movie. I think of all of them, it's the closest. Yeah, I mean, I when you talk about that lived-in feel yeah. and that, that vibe, right? like, so he really nails it. Yeah, so he's interviewed right throughout it. He gives an incredible yeah. take on how everything was done for the world. Um, I had. Carl Newman, who made Fanboys, he's, mm -hmm. he's in it yeah. a lot. And then I just went through everything. Bill Harmon, before he died, um, the old carpenter. He's yeah. very funny. Nice fun. yeah. He's really funny. He's still here, but uh, he kept going. Um, David French in London. I got all these people involved. Uh, Paul Bateman became a huge friend of Ralph Macquarie. Mm -hmm. And Paul. Ralph McQuarrie is so shy, he's very sweet, all right. and only drew, that's all he did. Paul yeah. said, if, if you have a bus ticket, he'd draw on it. <laughs> and uh, his website was absolute rubbish, so Paul did it for him. He finally convinced him, did all of that for him. He then went around all the events in America and everywhere. He sells Ralph's yeah. work, but he made sure it's... I've, I've purchased that <laughs> from so him. He always made sure everything was correctly done as Ralph yeah. did, so he knows all the Ralph stories. And again, Ralph, Ralph got the job, and um, he was down in LA, and it was John Barry who persuaded them that we couldn't afford to make the Millennium Falcon, or the hold and the hangar it went in, and we could do half of it and do a map painting. So yeah. he explained to Ralph how to do a map painting. Oh, wow. Ralph read about it and said, oh, you do them on glass. So he took his shower door off, and <laughs> the first night they went on the shower door, oh, wow. and then he had to get it to San Francisco. He tied it on the top of his old car and drove <laughs> out to San Francisco. And then he had to find a new shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, he, he was the shyest, most yeah. kind of, um, humble person you could ever meet, but he's a genius, and I really yeah. wanted in the documentary to give him back to the world the value of, um, and I think 
um, Gareth Edwards said, you know, if you, if you look at the team on Star Wars, if you took one person out, yeah. the difference it would make, if you yeah. took Ralph out of that equation, mm -hmm. it would never be the same film. Yeah. Um, and I think he deserves his huge place in the history of this whole. Yeah. And I know Doug Chang very well now. I, yeah. I had to go and talk to them and tell them how we did things. And Doug, to this day, even doing Mandalorian and the others, um, if he gets stuck, he goes and looks through the files and he said, Ralph's already designed it. It's yeah. already there. Yeah. And in fact, in Mandalorian, the, the, um, the cantina that Ralph painted, based on um, Rick's Cafe yeah. in um, Casablanca, didn't work because of the way the two robots had to come and then get told they couldn't come yeah. and then he was in a booth. So John Barry redesigned it. But that original design I notice is in Mandalorian. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's something <laughs> like we didn't know. Yeah. And that's a, a galaxy built on hope. A galaxy right. built on hope. Which and I, it, it was a two hour 20 fan special yeah. um, on Blu-ray. They pulled it at the moment because I, I broke it into six half hour episodes okay. and they're trying to sell it. So, but okay, I'm trying so to get my hands hopefully on Hopefully streaming somewhere soon. I hope, yeah. yeah. You never know. It's so hard nowadays to get anything out anywhere. But um, it kind of belongs on Disney Plus. Really. Yeah. yeah. But we'll see. We're, they're trying to sell it. Okay. But I'm trying to get back all the ones on Amazon that didn't get sold. I'm trying to get those copies so that we could sell okay. some. Because you've seen it. Yeah. We, we had a few copies we sold. Yeah. Uh, why don't I borrow Chris's copy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so that I could watch it. So uh, yeah, we can share it around a bit. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, I'm going to open the floor to, uh, to questions. Honestly, we could go on for like five more hours. <laughs> but uh, we need to eat dinner and do other stuff. But. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, when... When they're making the new stuff, and because all the new creators have such an eye for Easter eggs and details, I'll give an example. Uh, in Mandalorian, when they used the rod piece that was from the trash compactor to hold things open, yep. do they A, ever hit you up and be like, where'd you get this? Or, how, or maybe where did you find this? And B, you notice it right away, like when that when they yeah I did notice that, that one. Right you notice yeah, it? Yeah, no, I it? said it. There's that because <laughs> because it was one of my nightmares <laughs> because I took two pieces of drain pipe and I tried to link it together and I couldn't keep it straight. Yeah. It was a and God bless Harrison Ford because I used to go and say Harrison, I need your help here. I cannot make this work. And he said, Don't worry, Roger, in his way. He made it work. He did the same with the. Um, going into hyperspace, that, I couldn't make that work. He made that work for me. I saw that straight away. Yeah. Um, and Doug Chang did, Doug Chang. They had me go and they filmed me for two hours at the ranch, going through everything that I did. Um, and he kept saying, JJ, you should be the advisor on this. But I think Kathleen Kennedy blocked it, any of us going for some reason of her own. Um, and I know that, um, they had all of our original stuff that they could find, they got onto the set with JJ, and he was always referencing it. But they never asked, no. So the new shows, like all the Filoni verse, they, they never hit you up to? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? The one big one actually was, was the, um, was the lightsaber for me. Because on Empire Strikes Back, because um, John Barry had died, um, and I was I made the short film to go with it, so I wasn't on it. I was on the set a few times, but the designer was the art director on on the New Hope. The set deck, who I knew, who was much better at period. Oh, I keep doing this. He was much better at period films and stuff. For some reason, in the T-strip, if you look, he put rivets to hold the T-strip in, which I would never have done. It, it, to me, this is a mystical weapon of the Jedi's, and that made it human. Sadly, that went right the way through on every Star Wars movie from then on. That's the, the standard one, but um, I think it's on Boba Fett when they 
he has to get the lightsaber and he buries it and Dave will only put my original one in there he didn't use the one with rivet so that's why I was going Dave Dave I, I'm gonna go and meet him one day and <laughs> kiss his feet <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine your reaction as you were watching that on the yeah, yeah. Saw that. okay um, one thing that I think is brilliant about R2-B2 is that the number that George chose for R2 is an infantile number. It's the number two. He also looks, you designed him to look, he makes noises rather than fully constituted words, almost like a child. And he crawls around, sort of, like a kid who isn't going to walk yet. I've noticed that the style of how you created R2-B2 also looks a bit infantile, with the round head and the round eye. Um, I was wondering how much did you make those decisions consciously? How much of it was just subconscious, where on instinct you just felt this feels like the right kind of head, and now if it's analyzed by film analysts 30 years later, 40 years later, they, they can see what, how brilliant your thinking was. Were you doing that consciously, or was it just on feel? It was on feel. It, it's kind of my subconscious instinct that um, that somehow I identified with this world. Um, and I think it's from reading science fiction and, and growing up um, with you know, things like King Arthur. I mean, all of these are ancient stuff, Tolkien, everything has got that kind of used feel about it. But um, all of this was instinctual. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't even have a preconceived idea of the lightsaber. I knew it was a handle, but it was only when I saw that graphics that I went, there it is. Um, I think, you know, th that went for everything that we made, all the weapons, everything. There was a genuine kind of regard for, as I was saying earlier, the Death Star should be cold and engineered and there's no love in that world. And the Tuscan Raiders were rough, kind of desert people, so I gave them weapons to suit that. It was all consciously thought out very carefully for characters. E each thing that I did would suit the character and suit the film. Um, and I think that it's all subconscious, you know, and that's how myths operate, and they do penetrate your subconscious, and I think that's part of the reason that Star Wars penetrated to the world was because it was a kind of world that everybody understood and, and it was a comfortable with when they saw it. Instead, when you watch sci-fi, you know, plastic guns going beep and... I don't know why, but old science fiction films always had Indian collars, Nero collars, <laughs> for science fiction. Oh, that would be the future, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so Not much. Sure. Uh, thank you for coming. Here. So, so we're done, uh, come on and we're we'll wrapping it up. Tall people in the back. Roger still working up in the, in the front there, but uh, great Q&A, as you can see. Uh, so right now we're just going to wrap it up and take something.
Yeah, you're a front door.